The Battle of Jinyang was fought between the elite families of the state of Jin, the House of Zhao and the House of Ji, in the spring and autumn period of China. The other houses of Wei and Han first participated in the battle in alliance with the Ji, but later defected to ally with Zhao to annihilate the Ji house. This event was a catalyst to the tripartition of Jin in 434 BC, the forming of the three states of Zhao, Wei, and Han, and the start to the Warring States period. It is the first battle described in the Song Dynasty History Compendium Zij Tongjian. Chapter 1 Background By 490 BC, after the destruction of the houses of Fan and Songhang, control of the state of Jin, then the largest state in China, was contested by four elite families, Ji, Wei, Zhao, and Han. With multiple military victories under his belt, Ji Yao of the House of Ji exerted the most influence in the Jin court, all decisions of the state had to pass through him. He also controlled the most territory within the state. The reigning Duke of Jin, Duke Ai, was powerless to restrain him. So Ji Yao, in his pride, began to demand lands from the other three houses. The houses of Wei and Han reluctantly complied to evade Ji's wrath, but Zhao Xiangzi refused to cede the territories of Lin and Jialang, both in modern-day Lisha, to Ji. Ji, in retribution, formed a secret alliance with the houses of Wei and Han to attack Zhao. Zhao Xiangzi suspected an attack from Ji, since he had heard that Ji sent envoys to Han and Wei three times, but never to Zhao. After rejecting suggestions to move to Zhangxi or Handan out of concern for the people there, Zhao Xiangzi asked his minister Jiang Mengton where he could prepare his defense, and Jiang Mengton suggested Jinyang because Jinyang had been well governed for generations. Zhao agreed, and summoned Yenling Sheng to lead the army carriages and cavalry ahead to Jinyang, Zhao himself to follow later. Once in Jinyang, Zhao Xiangzi, following the suggestions of Jiang Mengton, issued orders to refill the granaries and the treasuries, repair walls, make arrows, and melt copper pillars for metal. By virtue of past governance, the treasuries, granaries, and arsenals were filled within three days, and the walls repaired within five. Thus all of Chinyang was prepared for war. Chapter 2 Battle When the three armies of Ji, Wei, and Han reached Chinyang in 455 BC, they laid siege to the city, but for three months they could not take the city. They fanned out and surrounded the city, and a year later diverted the flow of the Fen River to inundate the city. All buildings under three stories high were submerged, and the people of Chinyang were obliged to live in nest-like perches above the water and hang their kettles from the scaffolding in order to cook. By the third year, supplies had run out for the Zhao, diseases broke out, and the populace were reduced to eating each other's children. Although the common people remained firm in the defense, the court minister's loyalties began to waver. Zhao Xiangzi asked, Zhang Mengton, our provisions are gone, our strength and resources are exhausted, the officials are starving and ill, and I fear we can hold out no longer. I am going to surrender the city, but to which of the three states, should I surrender? Zhang Mengton, much alarmed, persuaded Zhao not to surrender but instead, sent him out to negotiate with the houses of Wei and Han. The houses of Wei and Han were promised an even split of Zhao's territories when the battle was won, however both the Wei and Han leaders were uneasy, since they understood that they too would be conquered if Zhao fell to Ji. Ji Yao's minister, Zai Si, warned Ji that the two houses were going to revolt, since the men and horses are eating each other and the city is soon to fall, yet the lords of Han and Wei show no signs of joy but instead are worried. If those are not rebellious signs, then what are they? Ji paid Zai Si no heed, and instead told the lords of Han and Wei of Zai's suspicion. Zai, knowing that his warning fell to deaf ears, excused himself from the battlefield by going to the state of Qi as an envoy. Indeed, when Jiang Mengton secretly met with Wei Huan Zi and Han Kangxi, who confessed that they were secretly planning to mutiny against Ji. The three discussed their plans and settled on a date to execute the plans. Jiang Mengton returned to Chinyang to report back to Zhao Xiangzi, and Zhao, 
in joy and apprehension, bowed to Jiang several times as a sign of great reverence. One of Ji Yao's clansmen, Ji Go, by happenstance, observed the leaders of Wei and Han after the secret meeting, and warned Ji Yao of the possibility that they might rebel, judging by their lack of restraints like before. Ji again chose to put his trust in his two allies, saying, since I have been this good to them, they would surely not attack or deceive me. Our troops have invested Qinyang for three years. Now when the city is ready to fall at any moment and we are about to enjoy the spoils, what reason would they have for changing their minds? Ji told Wei and Han what Ji Go said, and the two learned to be cautious when they saw Ji Go the next day. Ji Go, seeing the change in their looks, insisted to Ji Yao that the two ought to be executed. Ji Yao would not hear of it, and Ji Go suggested another plan to buy their friendship, to bribe the influential ministers, Zhao Jia of Wei and Duan Gui of Han with enfeoffment of the Zhao lands. Ji Yao rejected the proposal because the Zhao lands were going to split in three already, and he did not want to receive less than one-third of the eventual spoils. Since Ji Yao would not listen, Ji Go left him and changed his surname to Fu as a precaution. Hearing this, Jiang Lington urged Zhao Xiangzi to take action immediately, lest Ji Yao changes his mind. Zhao then dispatched Jiang Lington to the camps of Wei and Han, alerting them of the time of the final attack. On the night of May 8, 453 BC, Zhao troops killed the men guarding the dams of the Fen River and let the river flood the Ji armies. As the Ji armies fell into chaos trying to stop the water, the Wei and Han armies attacked Ji from the sides and Zhao led his soldiers in a frontal attack. Together they inflicted a severe defeat on Ji Yao's army and took him prisoner. Zhao Xiangzi had a grudge on Ji Yao because Ji had often humiliated him in the past, thus he executed Ji and made his skull into a wine cup. No one in the house of Ji was spared except for Ji Go's family, who had already changed their surnames and fled. The territories of Ji were evenly distributed among the three victors. Chapter 3 Aftermath With the elimination of the Ji house, control of the state of Jin fell to the remaining three families, their powers unchecked by anyone in the state. In 434 BC, following the death of Duke Ai, the three families annexed all of Jin's lands, leaving only the capital estates of Jiang and Kua for the next Duke of Jin. In 403 BC, the Wei, Zhao and Han lords all went to King Weili of Zhou in Luoyang and were made marquises in their own right, establishing the three states of Zhao, Wei, and Han, ushering in the beginning of the Warring States period by Sima Guang's definition. Most historians, when referring to those three states, call them the Three Jins. The state of Jin continued to exist with a tiny piece of territory until 376 BC when the rest of the territory was partitioned by the three Jins. The legalist thinker Han Feizi of the late Warring States period used this battle as an example of failure via greed and perversity, one of the ten faults that a ruler should not have. He reasoned that because Ji Yao was too fond for profit, he opened himself to the destruction of the state and his own demise. The Song Dynasty statesman Sima Guang, in his E.G. Tongjian, attributes Ji Yao's failure to his lacking virtue compared to his talents, and thus invited disaster. 